Okay, welcome back to the second part of One Man's Faith. Hopefully you now have your Bible uh, and a cup of coffee, and you're, you are ready to, to dive in and look uh, at what the Lord is doing for the people of Israel here. Now, they've been wandering 40 years. They're getting ready to go across the Jordan. And I mentioned before we went on break that I said that the Jordan and the Red Sea represent two baptisms. And that's what we have as Christians in our lives. When we come out of the world, Egypt, and go to the promised land, we go through a baptism. It's called the baptism of water. The baptism that John the Baptist performed, the baptism that Jesus partook of, and the baptism that, that we more or less are, are required to be a part of. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, go into all the world baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so baptism shows coming out of the world because we die. And then we are resurrected when we come up again showing the new life. Your life is totally different. If you've accepted Jesus as Lord and you've been baptized, your life is totally different. You are the, not the same person as you were. And so we enter into the kingdom through, through salvation and baptism. And I believe baptism goes a little further. It's not just a demonstration, but I believe something happens in the spiritual realm to you when you are baptized. Can you be sprinkled? I know, I know there are several denominations that do sprinkle, but Jesus said, teach, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And Jesus taught in this case, by demonstration, that baptism was an immersion into the water. And I believe uh, Paul talks about it in, in uh, Romans and... Uh, it's either Colossians or Timothy about, about, about the immersion. And so... I believe the Bible really teaches that we need to be immersed and not sprinkled. Can we be sprinkled as, a, as an infant? Well, is that a baptism? Not to step on any toes, but I, I, I don't see that biblically. Uh, baptism needs to be something that we understand. Is there an age limit on when we can be baptized? Not really. Not really. If you're old enough to, to understand that you've accepted Jesus as Lord, then you're old enough to be baptized. And, you know, that could be, that could be, that could be as young as three or four at least. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think that there is a limit. Now, there, now some churches do, and I, I don't blame them, so that they have an understanding that that person has the understanding of what they're really doing. And that's what we need to see and understand, that there is a reason that we are baptized. It's not just to fulfill the law, so to speak. It's to, it's to follow the process that Jesus started by himself being baptized. And I believe it starts some things in the spiritual world that we don't understand or comprehend right now. That by our physically being baptized, it's like the example in, uh, in Kings, uh, I, I want to say Hezekiah, maybe Josiah, but, but uh, uh, Elijah goes to him, the king is, uh, no, Elijah is dying. The king goes to him. And Elijah says, I want, you to take some, I want you to take some arrows and pound them on the floor. And so the king goes and quits. 
And Elijah fusses, Elisha fusses at him and says, oh, did I tell you to only do it three times? If you had continued on a couple of more, you would have had complete victory over your enemy. See, just by doing a physical uh, example, just by doing something in the physical, he would have changed completely things in the spiritual that would have affected the physical. And I believe that's what happens to us when we are baptized. Do I have anything to back that with? Not really. But, I, you know, you don't have to believe me on that. But that's what, that's, that's what I see and one of the reasons why I believe we need to be. Okay, after that, they start to the promised land. They would have crossed over into the promised land had they believed. And that would have been and is, is demonstrative of the second baptism, which we go through. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which leads us into the promised land. That there, what, what, I say that because there is more. There is more than we understand when we go through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's, it's, it sets us, it aligns us spiritually with, with the things in the supernatural that we don't have a total understanding of if we're not. But I thought, I thought I was baptized in the Holy Spirit when I, when I was saved. Probably not. Uh, where we normally get that from is Jesus, it says Jesus breathed into the disciples, and we've talked about this. Jesus breathed into the disciples, and, re, and he said, and what most Bibles quote it as, receive the Holy Ghost. Well, the word for ghost is pneuma, which is the same word for breath. And what Jesus did is the same thing that God did when he breathed into Adam, when he, when he breathed in. I mean, here was this piece of, well, it probably wasn't poof jerk because he was able to, stay, able to stay in place. But he, God built a man on the ground of earth, kind of like when we go to the sea, Sure, and we build a castle. Well, God built a man. And then it says he leaned over and he breathed into the man and the man became, or that piece of dirt became a living being. That's what Jesus did. And so I believe correctly that it is receive holy breath because Jesus breathes into us we are a dead person, a dead spirit. Our spirit is dead because of the sin that was committed by Adam and Eve. So Jesus breathed into them. Now remember, this was after he was resurrected. So he breathed into them and said, receive holy breath. And that made them alive. And that's what happens when we receive Jesus as Lord. We receive holy breath. Our dead spirit becomes alive and is quickened. That's what happens at what we call salvation. But Jesus told his disciples, and we've talked about this. Jesus told his disciples, hey, do not leave Jerusalem until you've received the power because I am going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now, some people say, yeah, well, that was just the first time, so it had to be that way. No, because there are five instances listed in Acts. And, well, yeah, everything, everything in the early church was first time. But it, the pattern is there. And it is normally a second experience. I believe it should be right after a person receive salvation, is baptized in water, then they ought to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think it should be that quick. It shouldn't be like for many of us, we are baptized at 12 and we don't receive the Holy Spirit till we're 20 or whatever. You know, there, there seems to be a time lag and I don't believe it's supposed to be there. So we have a depiction here of two baptisms, the Red Sea going from the world into the kingdom and the Jordan going into the promised land and the things beyond 
that God has for us. And so they are now getting ready. They've been wandering for 40 years. 40 years, as a matter of fact, 40 years, 11 months. The Bible, the Bible tells us in, the, in Deuteronomy 1.3, 40 years and 11 months they've been wandering. Now Moses is, is I'm going to say sitting them down. I don't know how he did this because this was 3 million people. He, he spoke to them. And that's what Deuteronomy is. It's the giving, it's called the giving of the second law. But there is a lot more here, even before he starts to give the law. Again, as he starts to go back through it and remind them of what's happening. In these first 11 chapters, really, he, 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 he says, and you will see if you'll read through this, be careful, take heed, listen, obey. It brings life to you. If you will obey, I will prolong your life, he tells us. He says, if you will obey, I will be with you. And, and I kind of, I want to look at this. What, what, what does receiving the word do for us? What does it take? Why? You know, God, I don't think God would have uh, reiterated it so much if it wasn't real important to us. And you know, I'm, I harp on this all the time. We have got to get into God's Word. Because we've got to get that Word off the pages. It's got to go from being Logos, the written Word, to being Rhema, the spoken Word in us. And part of what Moses does here, in matter of fact, chapter 6, he says, and you shall teach this to your sons and your daughters when you sit, when you eat, when you run, when you lie down, whatever you do. Matter of fact, put it on the doorpost so that it's a constant reminder of what the Word of God is. And that's what, that's the kind of, you know, this is the, really, this is the last word that Moses speaks before he goes and he dies. So this is important. So let's take a break. Let's get a cup of coffee so we can look at some more of this, and I'll be right back. <music> 